Hello students, this is Professor McDermott. Well, uh, in today's lecture we're going to cover the dramatic events that took place in Europe in several decades after the fall of Napoleon. And there is a great deal of material to cover here, so I'm afraid this lecture will be rather lengthy. Bear with me, you may want to uh, watch it in two parts. But uh, the first issue we're going to take up is the restoration of the French royal family after the fall of Napoleon. Now, this was uh, brought about by a group called the Congress of Vienna that started meeting in Vienna, Austria in 1814 after Napoleon's first fall. And um, it's interesting, you know, you, you might think that uh, with Napoleon completely defeated, that the Congress of Vienna, which consisted of all the other uh, nations of Europe, might just eliminate France entirely. But that really was not um, on the table um, because all of the nations knew that uh, if France was gone, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire would become the great power of Europe and there would be no one to check its power. Um, and so uh, even the Austrian diplomat, uh, Prince Clemens von Metternich, agreed that it was necessary to keep France alive uh, in order to maintain the balance of power in Europe. So France was allowed to continue as a nation and the Bourbon family was restored uh, to power in the person of King Louis, um, who took the title King Louis the 18th, uh, who ruled from 1814 to 1824. Now there was a little hiatus in his reign because you recall that Napoleon came back briefly for um, the Hundred Days and the Congress of Vienna had to split up for a while. Um, but after the Battle of Waterloo, uh, Louis XVIII was firmly secured um, on the throne of France and the Congress of Vienna resumed meeting. And when um, the Congress of Vienna went back into session, Metternich's goal uh, was to make sure that never again would an upstart like Napoleon disturb the peace uh, of Europe. And as Metternich saw it, the two dangers to the um, security and uh, tranquility of Europe were nationalism and liberalism. Okay, um, Nationalism meant the desire by um, different ethnic groups to have their own countries. Um, so in Europe now you have huge multinational empires like Austria-Hungary, like um, the Russian Empire, and um, they were filled with many, many different uh, groups of people, different ethnicities, different languages, different cultures and religions, and um, many of these groups wanted independence from these empires. They wanted a nation for themselves. That's um, nationalism. And uh, so that would become a huge uh, revolutionary force um, in Europe in the 1800s. The other danger <clears throat> was liberalism. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, um, the people of Europe had awakened, um, had started demanding their rights, had started demanding constitutional government, had started demanding freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to participate in electing um, their rulers. So. Um, at Vienna, the crown heads of Europe set out to crush all of these liberal aspirations. And they formed um, a group, an informal group, called the Concert of Europe. The idea of the Concert of Europe was that um, if there should be a nationalist or a liberal revolt against any king or queen of Europe, that all the other kings and queens would immediately rush to their aid uh, and crush um, the revolt. Um, and so uh, basically the old order uh, reasserted itself in the aftermath of the French Revolution and set out to try to prevent any more uh, earth-shattering events like that revolution. Um, the Congress of Vienna also redrew the map of Europe, as we can see here. France um, still exists, but the Holy Roman Empire um, which had existed for about a thousand years is now gone. 
Um, in its place in the south, you have um, the Austrian Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, notice that Italy is still disunited and Germany is not united yet either, but Prussia uh, keeps growing larger and larger and really has become the superpower of Central Europe with an eye towards ultimately leading a united Germany. Um, notice also that Poland, even though it's marked as a region on the map, um, exists no more as an independent country. It had been carved up by Prussia, Russia, and Austria um, in the late 18th century. And uh, the Poles would not get their country back until after World War I. Uh, group 1, your document during this module is by a Polish patriot named Adam Mikiewicz, who's complaining about this situation and uh, predicting the resurrection of the Polish nation. Finally, notice also the, the continuing existence of the Ottoman Empire, bottom right corner of the map, um, in southeastern Europe and uh, Asia. This, of course, was the great Muslim superpower of the day. Well, after the Bourbon Restoration in France, uh, after the death of Louis XVIII, the next and final Bourbon monarch was Charles um, X. Um, and even though the Bourbon family was back on the throne of France, the people of France had not forgotten the French Revolution. So in July of 1830, when Charles X began to take some very authoritarian measures, um, the people rose up in revolt. Uh, these measures <clears throat> were part of laws called the July Ordinances of 1830. Basically, King Charles took away the vote from three-quarters of uh, the registered voters and also began censoring the press um, much more severely. And so um, the people flooded into the streets uh, of Paris and other cities in July 1830, and they did what uh, urban crowds always did when they staged revolts. They built barricades in the streets. Now, if you've ever seen the film or the, the play or read the book uh, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, uh, you know what a barricade is. Basically, people would bring out furniture and carts, uh, you know, old barrels or baskets or anything that they could find and heap them up in the streets, uh, forming a barrier um, so that government troops could not get past the barrier and they would hide behind this barricade and um, they would shoot or throw rocks or eggs or whatever uh, at the soldiers. Um, and so this was the typical method of um, street fighting um, in, in France. Um, in 1830, the result of the people going to the barricades was that the government of Charles X was overthrown and a new king um, came to power, a distant cousin of Charles. His name was Louis-Philippe. He was the Duke of Orléans, um, and uh, he became known as the Citizen King, and because his rule started in July 1830, we call it his, his reign from 1830 to 1848 uh, in France, the July Monarchy. Um, now, Louis-Philippe was known as the Citizen King because he set out to be a very different sort of king from any French ruler um, before him. Uh, he claimed to be on the side of the citizens and especially the bourgeoisie, that is the middle class, um, and to represent their interests rather than the interests of the nobles. Um, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister of France under Louis-Philippe, François Guizot, came up with a slogan for the July monarchy, which was, Enrichissez-vous, Enrichissez-vous which in English means enrich yourselves. That was the whole point of um, life in France under King Louis-Philippe for the bourgeoisie to become more and more prosperous, uh, more and more wealthy. By the way, it was also Guizot who made the famous statement that if a man is not a, a liberal at 20, he has no heart, but if he is not a conservative at 40, he has no brain. Um, so I'll just leave you to ponder that one. But um, to show the difference in the image that King Louis-Philippe was projecting, um, let's take a look at these pictures 
of the last Bourbon monarch on the left, Charles X and King Louis Philippe on the right. Now, if you look, um, you don't even have to really look too closely to see the dramatic differences. Charles X is presenting himself in furs. Uh, ermine, the, the fur that royalty wore, he's got his uh, crown there, his scepter. Um, he looks every inch an old-fashioned king of the old reg regime. Um, but on the right, look at Louis Philippe sitting in an ordinary chair, wearing the kind of ordinary clothes that a banker or a postal official or a businessman would have worn um, in his day. And instead of a crown, he's got a top hat, um, you know, that an ordinary bourgeois Frenchman and, um, of the time would have worn um, to work. Um, and so Louis Philippe obviously is really presenting himself as a man, if not of the people, well, at least of the middle class, and, and someone who's going to bring progress and uh, wealth to France. Um, and when I say progress, notice also the difference in the medium here. Uh, the painting of Charles X is a painting. It's an oil painting. Um, but Louis Philippe is so progressive that he's actually allowed himself to be photographed with the early photographic procedure known as the daguerreotype, um, showing also how forward-looking and modern his regime was intended to be. But even Louis Philippe eventually um, tried to make himself more of an absolute um, ruler. Uh, in 1848, um, he heard rumors of uh, liberals plotting reform, pr perhaps plotting to overthrow his government. And uh, he went so far as to ban a group of reformers from meeting at a banquet. Um, that they had scheduled. And as soon as he did this, the Parisian crowd flooded out of their homes and into the barricades, um, revolted against uh, Louis Philippe, and forced him to abdicate, that is, to resign um, his throne. Now, this was a very broad-based uh, revolutionary movement in the year 1848 in France. Um, not only bourgeois middle-class liberals, but also more radical Republicans who wanted to get rid of the monarchy altogether, and even um, socialists uh, make their appearance on the scene. Um, socialists uh, and even communists, okay? It was in 1848 that Karl Marx came out with his Communist Manifesto. So these are people who want to make really radical reforms, abolish private property, and create um, an international workers state. Um, so you got people from all over the political spectrum uh, fighting against Louis Philippe and together um, they proclaimed uh, the second French uh, Republic. The first one of course being the one during the French Revolution. Um, and this was an extremely progressive in some ways radical government um, realizing that there were large numbers of people unemployed in France, um, the Second Republic decided to put them all to work, to put them on the government's payroll in what were called national workshops. So these people were given employment doing public works like digging ditches or, ditches or improving roads, um, building public buildings, and so forth, somewhat like uh, the New Deal programs of President Franklin D. Roosevelt during our own uh, Great Depression. But in order to pay for these national workshops, of course, it was necessary for the Second Republic to heavily tax um, the French people. And, of course, um, that led to a backlash against the Republic. Um, voters, and of course the voting franchise had been opened up again um, to many more adult males, voters um, elected a National Assembly with many conservative members who wanted to end um, the National Workshops in order to bring down taxation. And so this new National Assembly um, in 1849 did just that um, and ended the National um, Workshops. Um, and that led many workers and unemployed people to build their own barricades to go out in the streets and to fight against the Second Republic in what were called the June Days. 
1849. But what this event, the June Days, really signals is a definitive break between the middle class and the working class. The coalition that had brought the Second Republic into existence was, um, was no more. Uh, the middle class had turned against the workers. Um, and in this breakdown of uh, consensus in the Second Republic, um, a leader emerged who happened to be the nephew of um, Napoleon. His name was Louis Napoleon uh, Bonaparte. And so uh, taking advantage of the chaos and disagreement, um, Louis, Nap uh, Louis, Louis Napoleon first became president of the Republic, and then in 1852, like his uncle, had himself proclaimed emperor, the Emperor Napoleon um, III, because Napoleon had had a son, and, and this Napoleon believed he had also ruled France, and so he took the, the title Napoleon III in 1852. And once again, uh, the new imperial title was put to a vote, a plebiscite, a vote of all the voters. And the voters were asked, do you approve of this man, Napoleon III, ruling over you as emperor? And once again, the vast majority of the voters, 7.5 million, uh, voted yes, while only 640,000 did not. More than 90% of the voters once again approved giving the liberty that they had won in the 1848 revolution away to the Emperor Napoleon III, um, showing once again uh, that people are more than willing to trade liberty for order. Uh, Karl Marx, the great communist writer, um, thought uh, Napoleon III's rise to power was absolutely ridiculous, and it was in his book called The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Uh, you may recall the 18th Brumaire was the day in the French Revolutionary calendar when the first Napoleon seized power, um, Marx made this famous statement. He said, quote, all facts and personages of great importance in world history occur twice. The first time as tragedy, the second as farce. Um, now, a farce was a kind of low uh, comedy that would have vulgar jokes and, and, and so forth on the stage. And what Marx is saying here is that um, the first Napoleon was kind of a tragic hero, but this Napoleon was nothing but a farce, a joke, uh, completely ridiculous. Well, uh, let's turn our attention to developments in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1848. And um, the situation there was also ripe for uh, revolution. Um, the 1840s throughout much of Europe were called the Hungry Forties. Um, and the famous Irish potato famine in which the potato crop uh, was blighted and disappeared, leading to massive starvation in Ireland between 1845 and 1849, the famine had also spread to continental Europe. Uh, potato crops were failing. Um, the weather wasn't very good, harvests weren't very good throughout the 1840s, and as a result, food prices were going up. Um, and, of course, since people are having to spend more of their income for food, they're spending less on manufactured goods, which means that factories are closing, laying off workers, and many workers are also suffering during these hungry 40s. Um, and that was true in Vienna, Austria. Um, on March 12th, a group of students at the University of Vienna decided to seize the initiative um, to start a revolution. They were young and idealistic, as, as uh, students often are, and they were sympathetic to the workers and the masses, and so they took over the Great Hall of the University, and from there they sent uh, people out into the streets to try to get the members of the working class on board um, with their uh, revolt. And this was um, quite successful. So workers and students began to build barricades um, in the streets of um, Vienna, and uh, they resist the troops of the Emperor Ferdinand I, um, who of course appear on the scene and begin to fight with the students and workers at the barricades. 
and it was um, very exciting. You know, it was really good to be young, to be alive, um, to be out on the barricades fighting for liberty um, in Vienna in the year 1848. Um, now, Emperor Ferdinand was really not the man to, to cope with a crisis like this. He really wasn't the sharpest crayon in the box. Uh, when he got word that students and workers were revolting in the streets, his comment was, quote, but are they allowed to do that? Uh, <laughs> um, and so Ferdinand ultimately decided that uh, it was time for someone who was more capable to take the throne, and he abdicated the throne. Um, and also his chief minister, uh, Metternich, um, was fired uh, by the new emperor Franz Joseph and had to uh, run away to uh, Great Britain. Um, and that left the fate of the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, hanging in the balance. Even in the best of times, it was really hard to keep this empire together. Um, it was vast, it was sprawling, and it contained um, members of many ethnic groups. Um, and each of those ethnic groups would have loved to have their own separate nation. Uh, we'll come back to this, but just to show you on the map here, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you see uh, German-speaking Austrians, but also Czechs, Slovaks, um, Slovenians, Croats, Serbo-Croats, um, Ukrainians, all, kind of, all kinds of different people part of this very multinational, multicultural um, empire. But uh, the most powerful ethnic group within Austria-Hungary were the Hungarians. Um, and the Hungarians uh, revolt really pushed the empire to the brink of um, collapse. And so uh, the Hungarians and also other ethnic groups managed to convince Franz Josef, uh, the new emperor, to grant them a number of concessions, liberal concessions, like uh, freedom of the press, constitutions, the vote for all adult males. And uh, Hungary really began to make progress towards having their own separate nation. They stayed within the empire, but for all practical intents and purposes, they were granted autonomy uh, under the leadership of their freedom fighter, Lajos Kossuth, um, the power to make their own decisions. Um, and, uh, the great nationalist force and the liberal force behind the Hungarian revolt is evident in the Hungarian national song, which includes the words, quote, we swear by the God of Hungarians, we shall not be slaves anymore, end quote. And so for a while, it looked like um, liberalism and the spirit of 1848 had won in Austria. We'll come back to Austria later. Meanwhile, let's turn our attention northward um, to Prussia. <clears throat> um, now, Germany is not unified yet. Um, the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire had left Prussia as a great power, but also many other smaller states all around. And as they began um, to learn of the revolutions in France and Austria, uh, revolts took place in many cities in what is now Germany and a number of the different states began to grant liberal um, reforms um, as well. Um, what about Prussia? Well, the biggest city of Prussia was Berlin. On March 16, 1848, um, news that uh, Metternich had uh, been, dis been fired uh, from his role in the Austrian government got to Berlin. And um, at that point, the people of Prussia began to surge out um, into the streets. And um, the King of Prussia, Frederick William IV, um, decided to give them at least some of what they wanted. And so he granted that um, censorship of the press would be abolished. And he also summoned a meeting of the Estates General, um, which as in France was the Prussian um, legislature. Um, but the people began and continued to demand more um, reforms. And um, they became more and more radical, more and more um, uh, 
violent in a sense, uh, at least in their words, and they began to shout slogans like, away with the military. Um, so uh, when the soldiers uh, that they were facing across the barricades heard that, uh, they began shooting and uh, firing cannons and, um, uh, and killing um, radicals in the streets. And it was said that Frederick William IV, when he heard the sound of cannon um, being fired at his own people, uh, broke down and wept uh, within um, the palace. Um, the fighting went on uh, all night on the barricades in Berlin, and uh, the radicals were using uh, a new flag, red, black, red, and gold color. You see it there in the image. This was the flag of a united Germany that they wanted um, to build. So you see the nationalist impulse here. They wanted to unite all German-speaking people um, in a new united um, German Republic. But um, they suffered a setback that night in Berlin because 800 of them were killed by soldiers out on the streets. And early the next morning, the surviving protesters dragged the corpses of those 800 to the great courtyard in front of Frederick William's palace and laid them out there for him to see. And Frederick William and his queen actually came out of the palace and they looked around at all the bodies and then Frederick William of Prussia did something really extraordinary. He took off his hat as a gesture of respect uh, to the people that had been killed by his own soldiers. Now, to understand the significance of this, you have to kind of think your way back into a world where life was a little more um, formal. Um, and gestures like this could have great significance. Kings never had to remove their hats to anybody. Uh, in fact, other people always had to remove their hats in the presence of the king. Uh, but the kings were allowed to keep their hats on. And so for Frederick William to um, take off his hat um, really was a remarkable gesture. And suddenly the mood of the crowd changed. And they began shouting uh, for Frederick William. And they began chanting, Long live the German Emperor saying that they wanted King Frederick William to be their emperor, uh, the emperor of a new united nationalist um, Germany. And for a while, Frederick William seemed to go along with that ambition, but um, he was fundamentally a weak uh, ruler, and there were many people at court, uh, hardliners, who began pressuring him to shut the door on this revolution, as you see in the political cartoon here. Uh, men like uh, the future Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm, Wilhelm I, and also Otto von Bismarck, who is um, Group 3's author uh, for this module. Um, meanwhile, in Frankfurt, Germany, a Congress of uh, German leaders met to try to create a constitution for a new um, united Germany. And over about a year, uh, they did cobble together a document but it was a very imperfect um, attempt, one that didn't recognize, for example, the rights of workers and peasants. It, it was very much slanted towards the needs of the bourgeoisie. Um, furthermore, uh, the cause of United Germany suffered a real setback when the German-speaking part of Austria refused to join this new German nation. And the Austrians told the Germans, thank you very much, but..." We like our multinational, multicultural society, and we don't want to put ourselves into a kind of German ghetto. Uh, so they refused to join. And finally, the last nail was driven into the uh, coffin of a united Germany uh, when King Frederick Re William IV got a message from the assembly saying they wanted him to be the new German emperor. Um, and he sent the note back saying, absolutely not. I will not accept your crown your, your crown from the gutter. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, Frederick William made it clear that if he was going to be the emperor of Germany, it would have to be on his terms. He would have to rule as an absolute monarch, um, not a powerless constitutional monarch. Um, and so for a time, that was the end of the project of a united German nation. Back to Austria now. Um, 
Emperor Franz Joseph was a very smart and capable man. In fact, he managed to stay on the throne of Austria-Hungary uh, right through to the middle of uh, World War I. Um, and he found a way to put an end to the Hungarians' nationalistic uh, ambitions. What, what Franz Joseph did was to reach out to the other ethnic groups um, in Austria-Hungary for their support against the Hungarians, because you have to understand that, that um, the Serbs, the Croats, and all these other groups hated the Hungarians as much as the Hungarians hated the Austrians. And um, so members of these groups, Croats, Serbs, Romanians, were more than happy to help Franz Joseph um, to undermine the Hungarian Revolution. And especially Franz Joseph gave the Croats weapons, money, and support um, if they would attack the Hungarians, um, which they did quite successfully. Uh, then Franz Joseph announced that he was restoring absolute monarchy. He was canceling all the liberal reforms he had for earlier granted to calm down the revolution. When the Hungarians heard about that, they declared themselves to be an independent republic, no longer part of Austria-Hungary. That was in April 1849. But at this point, Franz Joseph decided to invoke the Concert of Europe. Yes, um, that agreement that uh, other rulers would help any ruler who was in trouble because of nationalist or liberal revolts. And so he turned to Russia for help. Now, Russia was uh, probably the only country in Europe that was totally unaffected um, by the events, the dramatic events of 1848, because the ruler of Russia, Tsar Nicholas I, when he first heard about what was going on, he simply sealed off Russia's borders completely, stopped the trains, prevented anyone from going in and out of the Russian Empire <laughs> until things had died down. Uh, so there had been no revolution in Russia, and so the Tsar was in a very good position to send his large military um, into uh, Hungary and crush the Hungarian revolt at the behest of the Emperor Franz Joseph. And so we see here, in a sense, the betrayal, the failure, um, the wind going out of the sails of the 1848 revolts and the very high ideals and hopes of the peoples during what was called the springtime of peoples in Europe, uh, being crushed um, in the aftermath of 1848. And furthermore, in the following decades, you see that more conservative leaders within the various nations of Europe, but especially in Prussia, were able to co-opt nationalism and use it to pursue their own political agenda. Now, uh, Prussia, had become a military superpower ever uh, since the days of um, King Frederick the Great. Um, Prussia had been building up its army. Uh, in fact, sometimes people called Prussia an army with the country rather than the other way around. Um, Otto von Bismarck uh, became the chancellor, uh, the highest official in Prussia. Uh, below the king. And it was really Bismarck, who was a political genius, who set the course for uh, what was to follow. Uh, Bismarck's philosophy of politics is known as Realpolitik in German. What does that mean? Um, basically, it means a very hard-headed kind of practical politics, one that doesn't operate based on uh, dreams of freedom or uh, high concepts, really, of any sort but that is based simply on power, getting power, keeping power, holding on to power to the bitter end. That's real politique. And you see that uh, attitude of real politique in a famous statement that Bismarck made in 1862, quote, the position of Prussia in Germany will be determined not by its liberalism, but by its power. Not through speeches and majority decisions are the great questions of the day decided but through blood and iron, end quote. That was Bismarck all over, and Realpolitik. Um, but Bismarck's really greatest, greatest insight um, in Germany was that he realized it was possible to harness the force, the appeal of nationalism, and turn it 
uh, to serve his agenda, which was to create a united German Empire under uh, a German emperor, a Kaiser, who would be an absolute uh, ruler. Uh, and so you see that Bismarck really takes up the cause of nationalism in Germany, and he uses it uh, to crush liberal ambitions, the desire for reforms, uh, even more. Um, and it was Bismarck who brought about the unification of Germany in several stages. First, in 1864, Germany declared war against Denmark, uh, picked up a couple of regions uh, from uh, Denmark and added them to Prussia. In 1866, they went to war against um, Austria. Um, and of course, war fever is a great way to stir up patriotism and nationalism. Um, and so Bismarck continued this strategy most successfully in 1870 when Prussia attacked France, which was still a very uh, powerful military um, state. And a lot of people expected the French to really make short work of the Prussians and defeat them handily. But instead, the Prussian military machine just rolled into France um, and in a matter of a couple of months had overwhelmed all resistance by the French, um, bringing about um, the abdication of the Emperor Napoleon III and the creation of a new republic in France, uh, the Third Republic, um, that has endured to um, the present day. And so, uh, with France under his heel, Bismarck could dictate terms um, to the French. Uh, one of the prizes that uh, the new Germany would get out of this war was the annexation of Alsace and Lorraine, two French regions in orange on the map, which were incorporated um, into into Germany, and that really remained a thorn in the side of the French for many years, um, until World War One. Uh, one of the motives for the French to fight the Germans in World War One was to get Alsace and Lorraine uh, back. But um, with the French uh, eliminated uh, as an effective uh, fighting force, Bismarck was free to proclaim the German Empire, the Second Reich. Um, of course, the First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire of the Middle Ages. The Second Reich was this new united Germany in 1871. Um, the Third Reich, of course, would be the empire created, uh, the short-lived empire created by Adolf Hitler, as we'll see uh, later in the course. But um, uh, Wilhelm I was proclaimed, proclaimed the Kaiser of the new German Empire, which was created at the Palace of Versailles in January 1871. Um, and so this program, using nationalism to pursue conservative goals, proved spectacularly successful in creating uh, a more modern united Germany um, that emerged immediately as a dominant power in Central Europe. Finally, let's turn our attention um, to Italy and talk about how um, Italy became a united nation. And here we have to go back to 1848 again, um, actually to 1846. In 1846, a new pope was elected who took the name Pius IX. Um, and this Pius IX really caused a stir within um, the Catholic Church. Now, you recall that at this time, the Pope had a large area of central Italy, which was under his personal rule. You see it there on the map, marked uh, Papal States. Uh, and you see all the other little nations of a disunited Italy on the Italian peninsula. Um, but Pius IX um, wanted to reform the government of the Papal States. He wanted the people, especially, to have more input into governmental decisions. And so he began to create um, councils, assemblies, uh, with elected officials who would share the governance of the Papal States um, with him. And so throughout the world, people were shocked by this, and people began to call Pius the liberal pope. Um, if that sounds familiar, it should, because you've heard the same term applied to the current pope, um, Pope Francis. Uh, but Pius IX was the first liberal pope. Uh, however, that wouldn't last long, because... Um, 
1848, uh, the nation of Piedmont, you see there in um, near France in the northwestern corner of uh, the map, uh, declared war on Austria-Hungary. And uh, liberals within the Papal States um, really wanted to go to war um, against Austria, again, uh, to try to destroy these multinational empires to create new nations uh, in Europe. Also, these councils that Pius had created began to impose taxes on church buildings and other church um, property, hoping to raise money for this war against um, Austria. Now, Pope Pius IX could not allow the Papal States to go to war against Austria. First of all, most importantly, the Imperial Family of Austria were Catholic. And <clears throat> as the leader of the Catholic Church, he certainly couldn't declare war on one of his children, <laughs> one of his flock within his own um, church. So he stalled for a while <clears throat> um, and dragged his feet. Um, and eventually uh, the more radical forces in the city of Rome got tired of waiting for Pius to act. And so they proclaimed themselves independent of the Papal States, the city of Rome, in February 1849, proclaimed a new Roman Republic. <clears throat> Um, and great revolutionary leaders like um, Giuseppe Garibaldi and Giuseppe Mazzini, um, who is Group 2's author for this module, uh, showed up in Rome to lend their support uh, to this Roman revolution against uh, the Pope. But <clears throat> the Pope had a few cards up his sleeve, um, and he was able to appeal to uh, the Catholic rulers of France Spain and uh, the Kingdom of Naples. Actually, on, on your map there, it's called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Uh, the capital city was Naples. Um, and together, these Catholic powers were able to suppress the Roman Revolution and restore Pius IX um, to absolute rule of the Papal States. And from this point on, Pius was no longer the liberal pope. He canceled his reforms. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, became actually quite a conservative pope. Um, but the revolution in Italy continued um, in a new form. No longer as radical as it was before, the goal became not to create a republican form of government, but to have the king of Piedmont, whose name was Victor Emmanuel II, to become the king of a new united um, Italy. And by March 1861, um, enough territory had been captured by Piedmont that uh, Victor Emmanuel proclaimed himself the king of Italy, um, and this new kingdom continued to grow. Um, Victor Emmanuel was able to seize the area around Venice from the Austro-Hungarians in 1866, and that left only Rome uh, under the rulership of Pius IX holding out against uh, this new kingdom of Italy. But when the Franco-Prussian War broke out, um, the French troops who had been in Rome to support the Pope had to leave to defend their own country. And that left Pius IX really defenseless when um, soldiers from this new kingdom of Italy marched in and took possession of the city of Rome and annexed it um, to Italy. And that was the beginning of our modern United Italian state. In 1871, the government of Italy passed a law called the Law of Papal Guarantees, which allowed the Pope to keep a little postage stamp sized piece of ground, excuse me, in the middle of Rome, um, the Vatican, uh, for himself. Um, and so uh, Pius IX essentially became the prisoner of the Vatican, and he stayed within the compound of St. Peter's. And in fact, he refused to leave it for the rest of his life and go anywhere um, out of protest uh, that the Papal States had been taken away from him um, by Italy. And eventually, in 1929, um, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini made a treaty with the then Pope Pius XI, um, which confirmed that the Vatican City State was an independent country. Actually, it's the smallest um, independent country in the world. And it is still under the absolute rule of um, Pope Francis. 
but every other shred of Italian territory became part of this new um, Italian nation. And so you see that the nationalists did eventually um, meet their goals, but in a very different way than the radicals of 1848 had envisioned. Um, powerful united monarchies in Germany and Italy um, emerged that would become great powers of Europe. 